Welcome to Business Innovators Radio, featuring industry influencers and trendsetters sharing proven strategies to help you build a better life right now. Conversations with leading experts in business. I am your host, Mark Stephen Pooler. We have a wonderful guest coming on to the show today, Michelle Rainglass. No, our topic today is going to be really interesting. And sometimes in the workplace, we have all gone through some kind of sexual discrimination or harassment. So that will be a little bit of our topic today. I want to apologise as well right from the start of the show. I have a really bad chest at the moment, so do forgive me for my croaky voice. I have to apologise now. I just want to make an official shout out to our show sponsors, Dreamweaver Artist Ranch. We are streaming live on mspnewsglobal.com. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube. And we're also streaming through the E360 TV network under Fresh Takes, going out to Apple TV, Fire TV, Android TV, Roku, and many, many more. Let's bring in our incredible guest. Guest, Michelle Rainglass. Michelle, welcome to Brilliance Business TV. Thank you so much for having me on this, Mark. Nice to see you again. I'm really looking forward to a conversation with you, Michelle. Now, you spent five years in banking when it was unheard of for women to be in banking. Michelle, tell us a little bit about this. So, um, I had worked for, I'm segueing for just a second. I worked for my dad in an auto parts business. So that was kind of a dirty, you know, business. So all I wanted to do was work in a clean business. And so I decided my dream job was to be a bank teller. So um, I had a job lined up and I, you know, trained my replacement. And all of a sudden I was told they didn't need me. So I drove around. I wanted this job so badly. I drove around and around. And I found that, you know, I finally got hired. So I was a bank teller and I moved up to the operations department and I started being trained in the consumer uh, consumer loans department, as well as new accounts. I'd already been doing that. And what was interesting is we had no women officers to start. And the women who were all there were all bank tellers. And um, I hadn't really focused on that so much until I started realizing, you know, the way people were being treated. So sexual harassment was sort of a du jour type of thing happening. And so much so that you came, came almost immune to it. But I started making smart aleck cracks back to the person who harassed. Sometimes that stopped them. <laughs> they didn't know how to respond. But, you know, I tried to use humor. It was just one of those kinds of things. But we finally got our first female loan officer. I was so excited. Um, and so it was like, you know, I was was like my role model and she was tough, but the guys just really were brutal. And then we got another, a second female. And so then I'm being trained at this point in consumer loans. Now, then what happens, and this is a sort of a, I'm skipping a lot, um, but I got hired into the law department. So I, I worked while I was putting myself through college and then law school. So And my dream job now is to get into the law department. And I had one more year before I was going to graduate from law school. And uh, I get hired, even though I arrived late because I got lost in Los Angeles, which is about easy, really easy to do. Anyway, I get hired. I now I train my replacement. And it's my last day working at the bank that I have loved, even though you go through all these, you know, you're treated as a definitely you're, you're. being a woman was thrown in your face all the time. <clears throat> so um, in any event, the head of personnel came down and uh, he said, Michelle, I've got some good news and some bad news. And I go, what? What's the bad news? He goes, oh, no, don't worry. It's nothing big. Well, long story short, he's telling me that they weren't ready to hire me as a law clerk. They wanted to hire me as a legal secretary. And I said, 
I've done, you know, administrative work. I, I'm not interested. I'm going to be a lawyer very soon. So I want, I'm, you hired me as a law clerk. So I'm coming as a law clerk. And they said, <sighs> he finally told me they just weren't ready for me to do that. And I said, what's, what does it take to get ready to some, I mean, it's the lowest level job. And we went round and round and round. And then I, he kept saying, well, just give it a try and they'll get used to you. And I went, why do they have to get used to me? Now, what I didn't realize at the time is I would have been the very first female to have anything other than an administrative position in the law department. <clears throat> and so as we went back and forth and back and forth, and I said, I will show up as a law clerk. And he goes, legal secretary. And I said, I quit. And I was in tears. And uh, so that was the ending of that career. And I drove over to my law school and I found a, a lawyer uh, to work for. And, you know, that changed that. So that was the kind of the world, and I'm giving it short shrift, but <clears throat> I will say that those, all of those things at least helped prepare me for my law career <laughs> and, um, and being a stronger person. So We will talk a little bit more about your journey into law shortly. I just think it's important we address the topic at the moment of sexual discrimination and harassment in the workplace. I myself, when I was employed, I did suffer some bullying in the workplace, which it's really hard. It can keep you up at night. You can suffer stress, anxiety, depression, not being able to sleep. What does sexual discrimination and harassment look like, Michelle? And how can we solve this issue? I know it's a big question. I love the question. And it's really, really great. Um, what does it look like? That's the interesting part. A lot of times. So if we go back to when I first started practicing law, for example, or when I was in banking, um, it was not there's nothing subtle about it. People just said direct things to you. They talked about your body parts in front of you while they're right there. <clears throat> um, they would, you know, make little noises and sounds, things like that. <clears throat> and you know, you just rep rolled with it because you didn't know what to do. I was even in law school and still not knowing what to do about it. But fast forward, going into um, being a, becoming a lawyer, um, when as time went on, and of course, more and more lawsuits are filed and things, people get were getting smarter about how to not show the discrimination. So, and I like to be, po I'm a positive person, I'm an optimistic person. And so I do believe a lot of people change their ways, but there are a lot of, let's say leopards that didn't change their spots. They just changed how they delivered them. Yes. So it was, so it's the subtlety part, for example, um, you can have, this will be I, and by the way, it turned out discrimination and harassment were my specialties as a lawyer. And I had thousands of cases um, in that. And by the way, I even represented men who had been harassed or discriminated. Yes, because it does happen to men as well. That's a great point. Very much so. Um, I, one of my cases, it ended up on front page news on the LA Times, which shocked me. <laughs> I was uh, in line in, uh, in Hawaii, boy, about to board a plane, and uh, I saw my picture and I went, oh, my God. Um, but in any event, that case, I'll tell you, uh, I won't name any names or anything. My client was currently working and it was a big company in Silicon Valley. <clears throat> and she, these two bosses that she had were constantly talking, they were showing pictures of naked women. They talked about their spouses and their girlfriends and their sex and on and on and on. And she's, it's not like she's, you know, prudish, but she said, it. this is the workplace. And she kind of felt badly even having to explain. I said, you shouldn't have to explain a darn, I did said a different word, but that darn thing, you know, you shouldn't have, that shouldn't even be brought up. So she, anyway, she, but I did, wasn't working with her yet, you know, so she spoke up to these guys and um, they just started ribbing her even more. And when she finally complained is when she started getting even more, worse, worse behavior. And so she ended up getting to a degree where she had to go on a medical leave. It was, it impacted her psychologically and, and emotionally so much. So she's on a leave and she finds me and I'm representing her. The lawyers. Oh, so this case got front page news um, in our time, our Los Angeles Times. <clears throat> and so they actually, the lawyers actually went into court to quash any publicity on the case. And my client, by the way, did not want publicity. And by the way, just so you know, when the reporters told me they were on their way to 
interview me. I said, please, please do not. I was begging them not to do this. My client didn't want any press, et cetera. So, but anyway, this was a different era where it was kind of big news. So in any event, there she is. And now everybody knows, you know, that she has this sexual harassment claim. So, um, and now people who she works with are contacting her, you know, while she's on her leave and trying to heal. So it's just a never ending. And they just put, they, what they did in those days is they put the, they put the person on the person who's complaining, the one who's being harassed, they put them on trial. And so it's, it's like allegation. That's actually a really good point. And that's something I feel that does need to mich change, Michelle, because I remember quite a few years ago now when I worked in salons, I had a boss, a manager that was bullying me. And like you, I'm a nice person. I would just carry on getting on with the job and letting it go to the back of my mind it was keeping me up at night but because they were my boss or my manager it was really hard but when I finally went through the proper procedures and put in a grievance procedure the person that was doing the bullying got to stay at the salon and they moved me to another salon when I was the victim and it was like, I felt, why do I have to move when I'm not the one doing anything wrong? And I just felt like they just wanted me out the way and they didn't want to address the bullying. So this does happen. This is an issue, isn't it, Michelle? It definitely is. Um, as a lawyer, it's funny, I'll, I, I was a relatively new lawyer in my first couple of years, and I got invited to be part of a a big federal court committee and we show up at a meeting at the corp, the office of the, anyway, I'll just say one of the companies that was involved in this committee. And so somebody says, can somebody take notes? And everybody's looking around the room and everybody starts looking at me and I'm the one female in this group. And they said, Oh, Michelle, can you take notes for the meeting? And I, Oh my God, I so much wanted to say, everybody else can't write, <laughs> you know, to our type or, um, anyway, I did that. And, uh, court uh, depositions, if I wasn't known at the law firm, I would walk into the office and they would put me at the head of the table, which you think would be a nice thing, right? That's where they put the court reporter. <clears throat> and so I'm thinking, so I knew exactly what was going on, you know, so I just went ahead and sat there, <coughs> excuse me, initially. So, and, the uh, finally, the court reporter would show up and look at me and I go, I didn't ask to sit here, but I'll move. <laughs> so then everybody would go, oh, we thought you were the court reporter. And so it was kind of hard for a long while for people to actually perceive somebody as, you know, a woman as a as a, a lawyer. But anyway, today, coming back to your question, how does it look today? It's much more subtle and it can be. um let's say it's a territory, a sales territory. And so your territory, like say you're the, and it, by the way, I'll just, whoever the victim of the discrimination is, can be a male, can be a female, but let's just say that this female has a territory of, you know, four different states and, you know, lucrative, she's doing a great job. Um, and so she complains because she found out, I'm giving you actually a real scenario of one of my cases way back when, uh, she complained when she found out all the guys in her, you know, her colleagues had been invited to go to a Dodger game and she wasn't invited. And so, and the re way it came up was one of the employees was talking about a business dis situation that they discussed at the Dodger game. So she's like, well, why wasn't I there? So she contacts her boss. She says, I understand that you took everybody to the box. No, she goes, oh, not everybody. Joe didn't go. Well, Joe wasn't available or something. But so she goes, well, why wasn't I even invited? And he goes, oh, I just didn't think you'd even want to go. And he goes, it was just a social thing, you know. And so it was, so things like that. He goes, oh, we weren't discriminating, you know. And so it's just, there's other things where it's just very hidden. And so then the proving of the evidence becomes more challenging. So, and now as a mediator, you know, I'm, I'm, I get, I'm, I guess I have the catbird seat because I'm getting both sides in, input and, um, and I have the ability to tell someone if on either on the defense side, if, Hey, you've got real high risk here, or if it's on the plaintiff side who really doesn't have a case, you know, when, once I know all the details. So it's, 
a much better place than, um, you know, in, the, in terms of just being able to have enough information and data to help both sides. Hopefully keeping a lot of the peace as well, Michelle. Now, let's talk a little bit about your journey into law because you work full time at the bank to put yourself through college and law school, didn't you, Michelle? Yes. <clears throat> How was that? You know, my dad, work. my dad was a hard worker and I, he worked like night and day and everything. And so he was able to pay my first quarter of college. I went to UCI um, and I actually, I got accepted at UC Davis. I was debating about being a veterinarian or a math professor and, you know, all these things. But when I got accepted and my dad said, I can't afford for you to go up north, you know, so you're going to be living at home. And I was like, okay, so I'm now, I'm a, now I'm a math major. Um, and he was able to pay for the first quarter. And after that, you know, couldn't. So I just started, you know, I was always working. I've worked since I was 13 years old. Um, and before that, I was put in volunteer jobs. So one of those things that you kind of, as a kid, you're like, ah, do I have to? But it, I realized what that did is formed my philanthropic side, you know, so I appreciate my mother pushing me into that. Um, and I will say this for, and I know, you know, some people, I know a lot of people have had to really work hard to get themselves through school. It helped me completely 100% appreciate my education, you know, every bit of it. And uh, so I, I'm just full of gratitude that I had that experience to do that. But yes, that was, you know, so it's working full time. And uh, when I was with the bank, of course, that was, you know, in nine to five or whatever, the eight to five or <laughs> whatever the hours were, you know, and then I would go to, you know, uh, school at night and did that uh, for just a number of years. And that shows a lot of discipline and determination to follow your passions. And I can relate to that because I also built my entrepreneurship business whilst running my old hairdressing business that I retired from two years ago. So I totally relate to that, Michelle. Michelle, we're just going to a commercial break. Please stay where you are. Okay. Thank you for joining us for part one of Brilliance Business TV, conversations with leading experts in business. We are having a conversation today with Michelle Rainglass. We have been discussing sexual discrimination, harassment, law. Join us after the commercial break. Hello everybody, Cyberchuck 2.0 here. I'm so excited to be able to share my vision of Dreamweaver's Artist Ranch. They say you can't choose your family. Not only am I saying you can choose your family, you get to thrive with your family here at Dreamweaver's Artist Ranch. It's a place for like-minded individuals to come together to share experiences and gain experiences, not only through workshops, through performances, and through exhibits. This is a place where you can disconnect from the outside world and reconnect into a community of people that there is no judgment. There's only support. And this place is an amazing place to grow and to tap into your highest potential and to be able to show up all your talents. This is a place you can come and network and really thrive. I'm so excited for Dreamweaver's Artist Ranch. This is a place where dreams actually come true. I love you all so very much. I'll talk to you all later. Peace. Welcome back to Brilliance Business TV, conversations with leading experts in business. We're having a conversation with Michelle Rainglass. Before the commercial break, we have been discussing sexual discrimination, harassment, talking about law. Michelle, welcome back to Brilliance Business TV. Thank you. Um, by the way, I just have to say the Dream Weavers Artist Ranch, that sounded phenomenal. So They are the sponsors of my show. It's an incredible project. You should check out some of their links that were at the bottom. It's a great ranch that's being built, all eco-friendly, and it's for artists to go and be creative. They've got all sorts of events and 
entertainment bar. It's going to be incredible. So check that out, Michelle. So, Michelle, let's talk about how you were solicited by the FBI. <laughs> you can, well, actually, I had to, I'll mention two different things. <clears throat> so, um, back, this is a, a number of years ago. And um, they, the FBI was on a campaign to try and get more women into their ranks. And so I got approached. The two, there's two different, crit at the time, I don't know what it is now, but at the time it was two main criteria. One was a, a bachelor, I mean, an accounting degree. And the other one was, um, I'm trying to think if it was a math degree or something. But in any event, it was, they had two different criteria at the time. And or law, excuse me, it was law degree. I was trying to remember which part of my life they were interested in. So, um, and I was dealing with these, these, they were customers of my bank. And uh, I, at one point in time, I had the drive up window. I have to say it was the most fun part of my life. They gave me suckers to give to the customers and dog little milk bones for the dogs. <laughs> so, but anyway, so but you really got to know the customers well. You have little chats, you know, at, at that. And so, Anyway, then when they would come in, they would come over to talk with me. But anyway, when, one day I get approached, it was kind of several of them. I'm like, this is a little interesting. And they said, we need to talk to you, business. And I went, so it was like, you know, first it was a little fear. <laughs> what did I do wrong? Um, and then they said they were, they would wanted to get me interested into a position there. So they gave me uh, an application. Maybe it was that big. <laughs> a very, very big application. I filled it out and I went you know, a long distance in there. And then I was getting accepted. And the the next thing that was going to happen is I would be sent to Virginia for several weeks of training. And they started listing all these things. I don't know what got it, what it was about it. I just decided I didn't want to do that. That wasn't a path I wanted to go. Um, it's, I, I won't say I regretted it. It just, it's something I thought would be really, really interesting. But um, I know they were disappointed when I said no, and I stayed in just as a lawyer. <laughs> so, And you're also a co-author of the book, Women Who Empower. Tell us a little bit about that, Michelle. That was a wonderful detour I had not expected, was not intending to do. I was working on a different book, which I'm hopefully finishing soon. Um, I'm not hopefully, I am finishing soon. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> I am, I am. There's no hope in hope. <laughs> exactly. Uh, plus, I really am getting close. But anyway, so I've been working on that book. And I also was signed up for three programs, um, felt personal development programs. And one of them was with Jack Canfield. And it was, his, uh, anyway, so COVID hit. And so everything gets shuttered. So, um, excuse me. Jack Hanfield, bless you. Joe Can or Jack Hanfield um, created this four-month program called Reignite. Um, Jack Hanfield, Jack Hanfield Coaching Reignite, and he gave it to us for free just to make up for the fact that we weren't getting to go to his other program. He had no obligation to do that, and we still had our ticket when we opened up for the the real the other program. It turned out to be one of the best things ever in my life. Um, and it was every single day was a, ch this was the purpose of it. It's getting you out of your comfort zone, helping you grow out of who you are. And so every single day you had a new challenge. And so one of those challenges was to, we had to even dance like a TikTok dance and video it. And, oh my God, that was, I put that off to the very last minute and did it. But anyway, we, so we kept doing that. And as a result of those kinds of things, I'd never felt I'd never allowed myself to be that vulnerable before. And so it really, really, you know, as a lawyer, you want to put on a professional, you know, appearance, you want to have people that think you've really got it all. And, you know, you know, it all and all that stuff. And well, of course, we never <laughs> know it all, but we may tell people, or maybe try to think we do. But in any event, so as a result, it was like over 500 people in this class. And yet we really made connections and deep connections with one another. And I, I tie it to that, the vulnerability and the things that we were doing. And it's, by the way, it was seven days a week. So you, you had to do this fix, and you had like 48 hours or 72 hours to finish each challenge. So but in any event, in the course of that, one of the women that I met and became friends with, um, she's probably tired of hearing your name when I tell you, mention it, but it's Denise McCormick. And I saw that she was a best-selling author, author. And so one day we were chatting and I, and I asked her about that. 
So she introduced me to Kate Butler, who is a publisher, and she has a specialty niche. It's not the only thing that she does. She does she's a publisher of all books, but she has a specialty niche of group books, meaning um, multiple authors, co-authors. And so I met Kate and I was invited to be part of Women Who Empower. Now, the significance of Women Who Empower, the the, the it's like a little thing, but or maybe a, I think it's a big thing. I wasn't, like I said, I wasn't planning on writing this book. I wasn't planning on, you know, I'm already writing my own book. And in fact, to be honest, when I first got the invitation, I had to think about it. I literally was going, how am I going to get time to do this? I'm working full time as a mediator, just bringing, working, like just working, working while you're going to law school. Um, you know, I'm working full time and I have a very demanding job. And on top of that, I'm writing a book and now I'm thinking of adding another book. You know, are you nuts? And I started realizing you'd be nuts not to take this opportunity. But the most important part of that was I had been for years putting on women empowerment events. And when I was in, when I was a lawyer, I became president of our bar association. I was the second female to get elected to that. And as a, I became sort of a role model to a lot of people who were, you know, especially the younger people. And so Oh my goodness. I can't tell you how many people wanted to meet for lunch or pick my brain or can we talk about things? And I so wanted to help everybody, but there was thousands of people in the bar. And so I figured out, I figured to myself, one of these days, I'm going to figure out a way I have time to help, you know, groups of women. So when I became a mediator, that opportunity opened up. So I asked the one of the principals, we have three principals of the company I work with, which is Judica West. Um, and one of those, People is Rosemary, and she she was the one woman. And so I approached her one day, and I said, because I'm now doing mediation full time, and I said, I've had this passion, I've had this desire for so many years, and I just want to carry it out. So she worked with me, and so we started putting on women empowerment dinners. And I went up and down the state of California. I went to all our offices, and it was just I had a blast. And the, and it was so funny. I always had an agenda, and I had powerpoints, and I had all these, and I would have handouts and stuff. We never stayed on that agenda. <laughs> You know, and I guess somebody, if men are out there, they're probably going, yeah, get a bunch of women in the room. And <laughs> so, you know, we would talk, 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 but it was just finding out the interesting things that were, that were their concerns and people would bring up, well, this is how I'm treated. And so it, discrimination came up a lot. And so we, the ones that have, of us that were more senior, were able to give advice to, you know, the people who were coming, you know, newer coming into the profession. So anyway, um, that was my passion. So here I am being invited to write a book and of all books of all titles, it was women who empower. So my heart just went, got to do it. So anyway, I'm really grateful for that. And it was a amazing, amazing experience. Um, and it became a number one international bestseller on our first day that we launched. And, um, uh, can I show? You can show, yes. Okay. I would encourage everyone to go out and get a copy <laughs> of Women Who Empower. And I'm a big fan of Jack Canfield as well. I have met him in person. I've got photos with him. I've also done some articles for a book collaboration that he was part of. So I'm a big Jack Canfield fan. I'd like to see this TikTok dance video of you, Michelle, as well. <laughs> But, in the private vault. <laughs> but this this brings me on to my next question, which it leads really well, actually, because you was mentioning that you took on another book, you're working on a book, you was finding that you were really busy, you didn't know whether to say yes to this book. Now, I know you have some value to share around having balance. So let's talk yeah. about that a little bit, Michelle. Thank you for that, Mark. Um, so I have studied balance my entire adult existence. And why? I, I guess secretly I, I knew, but probably on the surface level, I was just sort of varying it. But I was really out of balance. Um, <laughs> you might imagine when you're doing as many things as I was. But I grew up in a busy household and it was kind of normal <clears throat> to be busy. My parents were always busy with Sunday mornings. We all had chores. We all did stuff. And so fast forward to becoming a lawyer and I did everything. I was on boards of everything and um, I had an, some kind of a touch where everything I, I joined, I ended up being chair of it. So it was like always doing those things. And then president of the bar, president of the bar, um, 
which I was, I'll never, I'll never regret having done that. It was just one of my, again, one of my very favorite experiences in connection and everything else. But um, it's, it was like, I think I was putting in 200 hours of work and 120 hours of bar work every single month. Wow. And, you know, lawyers keep track of their hours. And so I had, I kept track. And every time I look at the bar hours, I'm like, ah, sigh, <laughs> that it was, we needed to do be done. And so, in fact, it was funny. I actually, I was somebody, I think our executive director nicknamed me the Energizer Bunny. I was flattered by that. I liked it. And I liked, cause I always had energy. And uh, uh, so it was like, I thought that was a good thing. You know, now I look back and I go, you nut, <laughs> <laughs> you know, because it was because, and what I was doing was my favorite word ended up being yes. Michelle, can you do this? Michelle, can you yes, do this? Yes. Important point learning to say no. Right. And, and the no is one of the most important words I'm now learn. Um, judges even, it was funny and I'm not, not tooting my horn, but I just would, I, I usually did well in court and judges trusted me. And, and so Often if we had, let's just say people who are less reliable in, you know, in the case, the judges would always learn to I me, mean, Michelle, would you mind drafting that up? Michelle, can you do that? Michelle, would you do this over the, e the evening and, uh, you know, that kind of stuff? And I just, I'll, yes, yes, of course, Your Honor, I'll do that. Happy to do that. Um, and it was just a combination. And you start doing yes so many times, what you yes. lose is you. Yes, <laughs> very important point. And so I just was out of balance. And I, while I'm studying, Louise Hay is my first guru. Um, I like Louise Hay, yes. Oh, I'm so sorry. I wish she could live forever. Uh, just love, love, loved her. And so I read her books and I read it. I tried to practice everything there. And I kept thinking, why am I not getting better? Why do I still feel like, I felt like I had a racetrack going in my body. Yes. And I, I'm like, what's wrong? What's wrong with this? I can't figure it out. You know, and I'd, I'd say like, okay, I'd like to have a weekend and I'd say, I'll, I'll, you know, relax this weekend. And let's say I did relax that weekend. And it was still the same thing. It was all the running from here to there and whatever. And it was keeping up. And why do I have so much on my plate? And then on top of that, my close friends and my family were always mad at me. You know, I either had to leave something early or I couldn't make it. Now, mind you, when you're a trial lawyer, I was a trial lawyer. When you're in trial lawyer, you're a slave to the, you know, the trial and the trial schedules. And I had one year where I had trials, one to three trials, jury, these are jury trials every single month. Not all of them went, but they didn't settle until right there in the courthouse steps. So that was a hectic year. And I actually had to put out an SOS to the entire employment lawyer bar. And I was hiring people, just please come help me. <laughs> but anyway, um, so it's just like that. And I guess when you establish that kind of a work ethic, which is what we I look at it as, I just work hard. I just work, you know, it's it becomes ingrained in you and you don't step, you don't see that you don't see anything clearly, that's for sure. And I didn't understand until as or after I transitioned to being a mediator, uh, that's why I call myself reform lawyer, you know, transitioned into being a mediator. I thought, this is perfect. I'll, and, you know, I, I'm going to be, I told everybody, I'm going to have more time for you. You know, I, this is great. No, no, it's going to be a whole different life. And I started realizing years into it, it actually took two autoimmune conditions and a green smoothie spill, slip and fall concussion. But <laughs> um, but it took all of those to really get me to realize I carried all that baggage of being imbalanced with me into my mediation career. And so I've been working on it for several years, you know, the, the whole duration of that once I had that epiphany, and trying to get into balance. So but, but on top of that, studying it for decades, um, and I realized, so anyway, I got invited to, I, I mean, I'll just go into this one, how I really got into this book on balance that I'm writing now. Um, I was, I'm in the International Academy of Mediators, one of the best organizations. I love everybody in it. And um, it's, they, they asked me to speak one day and I said, I, I had decided that year, you know, okay, who in this audience or anyone watching this? has had to go to ubiquitous conferences and meetings and whatever. So you get tired of them sometimes, you know? So I decided I was going to give myself a break and um, I wasn't going to go to any, there was a whole set of fall conferences, you know, in the autumn. And I just, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to just give myself a break. That's my, so then I get this 
you know, this e- it was actually an email. Would you, hey, we want you to speak for us. And I, so I wrote back, oh, I'm so honored. Thank you. Um, I'm giving myself a break. No conferences this fall. But thank you. Click, you know, <laughs> end, of, end of email. Another email comes back. Well, we really want to talk you into speaking. And so I go, I'm really not going. And finally, I, I said, what's the topic? And they told me balance. And I went, <laughs> have you met me? Seriously? What do I, how can I, can I talk about balance? And they said, we disagree. So I said, I'll think about it. That was my balance. I said, let me think overnight because I'm so used to saying yes. It's really easy to persuade me. Um, and so I thought it over. And I decided I'll go up late the night before, hang out for the a day and then um, and do our talk. And then I was going to have a taxi ready to take me to the airport. So that was my balance. I wouldn't be there for the whole conference. <clears throat> so it was for breakout sessions. Um, and I, like there's always a plenary, which is where everybody's together in the room and then people break out. We had about, I'm guessing 150 people and probably eight or 10 breakout rooms. So we were in one of the big big halls, if you will. So there's a whole bunch of tables and several other breakouts are going on in the area I'm in. So I just pulled a couple chair, chair or a couple tables and chairs together. I was, we had to keep pulling tables, more and more tables, more and more tables. I'm like, what on earth? And people just started bringing their own table, you know? And I said, where did you all come from? I couldn't understand. And by the way, the person who wrote me into this, I, I made him, he has to, he had to co-present with me. <laughs> that was his punishment. He's an actually fabulous person. Um, so we had the best time of our lives. We just, everybody was, uh, we had pe- women from India who were sharing things that they do for balance. Um, and di- so we're getting just cultural, because these are people all over the world. It's international and all that. So um, that was fun. It was great. And I said, okay, I did it. I get home and our Orange County Bar Association, somebody, one of the committees, they said, hey, we heard you did this talk. I'm like, how'd you hear? Oh, by the way, the talk was in Austin, Texas. I was out of state <laughs> when I did the balance program. So, and they said, uh, they said, we heard you that you did this program. I, how'd you hear that? I said, oh, Bertie told us. And they said, would you do it for us? And I said, sure. So, and then after that, the federal court contacted me and said, we heard that you did this. Now, by, by the way, doing anything for the federal court is a little stodgier, but I, I was having people stand up and you know, do things in the program that, you know, to show them different things they could do for balance. So it was interactive and the, the federal court one, they were like, do we really have to stand up? Will we have to do anything or participate? But um, anyway, it was, that got me on. And the next thing I knew, I am writing a book. I didn't think. I, I want gonna... to talk about that, Michelle, actually. We're coming up to the last couple of minutes, mm-hmm. but you are launching your new book how to break free from addiction to busy tell us a little bit about it and i know people can sign up on your website as well thank you yes i just started collecting things and it's a it's an entire book for your full existence being balanced it covers every area relationships it covers your relationship with money it covers i cover stress i cover the causes of it you know and you know it's basically and i put it in really i because I wasn't here, I'm studying balance and I'm not getting it. And I finally figured out all the reasons why I wasn't, it wasn't cementing. And so I'm taking all that and I put them into, I call it bite sized pieces to make it easy to do. And I have tips at the end of each chapter and a quote at the beginning that is, you know, resonate. So inspiration. So what I'm, I, I am getting ready to launch pretty soon. Um, And so if anyone is interested in getting information about it or being on that list for notifications, uh, my website is uh, www.rhineglassadr.com and people can put their, all they have to do is put their name and their, uh, and their, their email address and their name and we'll notify you. And I'm going to be doing, setting up a launch party and all that stuff. But right now it's just, if you want notification, um, for that book and in and the website by the way there's also a way you can get the women who empower it's kind of a book looming at the front of the <laughs> of the website i would encourage everyone to sign up so that you're in the know for how to break free from addiction to busy go to www 
rainglass.com sorry let me start again www.rainglassadr.com that's www.rainglassadr.com michelle i have thoroughly enjoyed having a conversation with you thank you so much for being my guest today on brilliance business oh thank you i'm so grateful that you had me on the show thank you so much mark I thoroughly enjoyed having a conversation with you. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in for Brilliance Business. T Thanks for listening to Business Innovators Radio. To hear all episodes featuring leading industry influencers and trendsetters, visit us online at businessinnovatorsradio.com today.